If you can turn quickly to these along with me, great. If not, if you'll listen carefully, have five different portions to read. That means the message will be five times longer than usual this morning, but we'll uh, get done as quickly as we can. You, you follow along quickly with me and uh, listen carefully. And here we go. John chapter number 16. Begin reading down in the seventh verse. John 16 and verse 7. Words of Jesus. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Acts chapter number one, we're flipping forward in our Bibles, one book, first chapter of Acts, Acts chapter one, verses four and five. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. And look at verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Ephesians chapter 1, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, looking at Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians 1. You find the first chapter, look at verse 12. Ephesians 1, 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. And then still in Ephesians chapter number four, trying to make it easy for you as we could. Ephesians 4, 3, uh, one verse, Ephesians 4, 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And then late in Ephesians 4, verse 30, Ephesians 4, 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let's pray. Lord, as you help us now by the power of your Spirit, we've just read about you, your Spirit, and the work that you want to do and that you have done in the past and the purpose for which your Spirit is given. So, Father, would you manifest that in our presence for your glory this morning, for not of a, a man's uh, personal benefit or glory, but for your own. And Lord, would you just soften our hearts, make them moldable, pliable, and responsive to the truth of your word as we give the word of God. We thank you for it. Hide us behind the cross of Christ, and may you withhold our lips from words that be contrary, and may we speak boldly every word that you have spoken this morning in your presence. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We've read multiple texts this morning, and you probably saw the common denominator in everything that we read. It was clearly the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the third person of, of the Godhead. I would like to title our message this morning, What in the World is Wrong with Our Church? What in the world is wrong with our church? I do not um, lightly cast a negative title to, to a message, but I think if we were all honest, we would have to in unison agree that any church, every church, any local church, I would have to honestly say, yes, there are uh, things that are wrong, there are deficiencies, there are, are drawbacks, there uh, perhaps are open and glaring sins and errors and things wrong with, with our church. So does that question shock you when I say, what in the world is wrong with a church? To the casual attender, perhaps to the guest, or to one who, who uh, just uh, infrequently attends, you say, my, what good music, uh, what good singing, how wonderfully the choir sang, and that's true. 
and what a sweet spirit among the people and how uh, welcome they, they made us feel. And that's true. Uh, we have used in, in times past for our church, the friendly church that cares. And you've, you've been that and uh, you have made people feel welcome at home. You've attended to the needs of, of people. Uh, you've been a wonderful church. You, so you say that's kind of a shocking uh, question that you pose for us this morning in the title of the message. What in the world is wrong with our church? So if this question shocks you. I would like to remind you that it is a legitimate question. What if we were to ask that question about America? What in the world is wrong with America? Well, it's the greatest country that's, that's ever existed, and it is. And it's a God-blessed country. It was founded upon uh, the, the God that we're speaking of this morning. And it has uh, been unusually used of God to, to promote the giving of the gospel to the corners of the earth. Do you know that? Did you know that America, like no other nation ever in history, has been used by God to trumpet the gospel at home and to the ends of the earth? And uh, millions upon millions of people have been saved uh, through the gospel witness that has gone out from America. What in the world is wrong with America now? Well, time would fail us to uh, start into that and we would get political. It almost happened in Sunday school this morning, almost, uh, and we could, and we'd be right in what we said. You know, there's, there's been a lot of oppression on churches and pastors. Oh, you can't talk about that. Did you know that constitutionally in America, a pastor can get up and take a stand on what God's Word says about truth and righteousness and about lifestyles and about sin and about a lot of stuff. In fact, uh, we're, we're completely free constitutionally to attach to, to that voter guides that can help you know where the candidates line up on some of that stuff. And we'll do that in the coming days. We'll put it before you. We'll let you know uh, this, this candidate believes in killing babies. You want to vote for, for her, for him? Uh, you want to you want to do that? Uh, we're we're free to do that now. I cannot endorse a political candidate uh, from the pulpit as as a church uh, a pastor. I cannot do that. I, I understand the the complications of of that. But you know we've gone far 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 astray uh, when we're afraid to take a stand for what's right and what's proper scripturally and and biblical. So when I ask that question, what's wrong with America? We're not even going there this morning. But I'm real interested in that. I am, and I'm real involved with that as, as well. Well, let's, let's ask ourselves some questions from these supporting texts, if we could. And, and let's allow that question to be rephrased this way. Uh, let us ask ourselves this question. What in the world is wrong with me? Now, don't, don't bristle a little bit when I say that, because if we're talking about a church, and if you're part of this church, either as a member or as a regular attender, or as an infrequent attender, but uh, this, this is where you go, and, and we understand that, that we collectively belong to this church in some ways, uh, maybe more particularly than, than others. If we say, what's wrong with the church? We, in essence, are asking, what's wrong with me, aren't we? If you're the church and I'm the church, if, if we constitute this, this local body together, if there's something wrong uh, with, with the church, there's something wrong with me and with you and with, with us. And that makes it a little more personal, but a little more uncomfortable, doesn't it, when we do that? Now, I read this, this passage, these uh, multiple passages uh, together concerning the Holy Spirit because I would like for us to see that there's a deficiency in our church and many others, if not all others, uh, related to the person of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Uh, that question was asked one time of uh, Dr. Walter Wilson. Dr. Walter Wilson. He's familiar to some of you. He's uh, one of my heroes of the faith. He's dead and gone now with the Lord. 1969, I believe he, he died. He was, he was born in the uh, late 1800s. He was a medical doctor, evangelist. He was a speaker. He was a soul winner. He was a great man, but he was saved as a teenager at age 15. But 18 years later, at the age of 33, Walter Wilson was in connection with, with a man who knew the Lord intimately, and the man posed this question for Dr. Walter Wilson, who was already a prominent doctor, and he was being used of the Lord in, in ways in, in his work. But this man posed this question to Dr. Walter Wilson. He said, uh, who is the Holy Spirit to you? And I'll pose the same question to you this morning. Who is the Holy Spirit to you? 
Dr. Wilson answered the same way that many of us would. He said, why, he's the third person of the Godhead. We sang a song about that just a while. We address the Holy Spirit uh, in, in one of the songs. See, he's the third person of the Godhead. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And, he's, and he was, again, asked the question, but who is the Holy Spirit to you? And he again restated some of the Bible doctrines concerning the existence of the Spirit of God and the reality of the Spirit. He's the comforter. He's, he's the teacher. He's the restrainer. And a lot of things that Dr. Wilson said. And after about three times, he said, but I ask, who is the Holy Spirit to you? And Dr. Wilson had to say, why, he's no one at all to me. And he was saved. He was a man who had been used to a degree in the Lord's work, and he had to honestly answer, the Holy Spirit of God is no one to me. He's nothing to me. And I believe if we were honest this morning, candid with ourselves and before God, we would have to have a similar answer at best, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? There's a deficiency in, in knowledge and emphasis and certainly in relationship to the Spirit of God. Our churches today are largely ignorant concerning the Holy Spirit. Yes, we know about Him, don't we? We could uh, give off the doctrinal uh, things that I just mentioned concerning the Holy Spirit of, of God, but we do not know Him. We do not know Him. It is a relationship type of a knowledge that I'm talking about. Well, I was just thinking this morning of, of knowing people. We have some new folks in our church. We have some new ones that have recently come to, to be with us. And, you know, uh, as we, we get to know these people, we, we're reminded of the fact that it, it uh, involves building a, a relationship, not of just knowledge or, or whatever, but, but actually it takes time to get to know someone. Uh, for, for instance, if, if I were to... Uh, uh, say, do you know uh, Allie? Then I would be referring perhaps to maybe the gentle way that she deals with some real uncomfortable situations in the school office gracefully. I've heard some of that. And I'd say, what about, uh, what about Kendall? Do you know her? And then I would have to be reminded to the little box on the floor back there and the, and the little tiny violins and uh, describing the parts of the violin to her little bitty students that are just about that tall, some of them, and how she, she gently and tenderly and wonderfully works with them. And I say, well, what about Anthony? What do you know about him? And I would instantly be reminded of his John and Romans distribution, how he just hit the door of the vehicle and out he goes and up one street down the next. And if somebody gets behind, he'll go across the street and take up the slack for them. And he's, he's a, he's a go-getter. Well, these are just little things that we begin to learn and appreciate about new people that we come into contact with. But as you know, that a building of a, of a relationship with the Holy Spirit of God is the same way. We can't really know them until we're around them, until we uh, interface with them. And this is the age of the Holy Spirit, according to God's Word. Uh, we call it the church age. We call it the day of grace, the age of grace. Uh, more specifically, it is the age of the Holy Spirit. This is His age. He's the Lord of the harvest. Uh, everything that happens, uh, this, this age, is to be under His superintending uh, influence, under His direction. And we don't even know Him. He's become a stranger to us. Our text from Ephesians helps us uh, in, in part, as we read that one verse from Ephesians 1.13. I would like to refer to some of these things, and we'll get on with the, the heart of our message and give you a lengthy introduction of necessity this morning. But when we read in, in Ephesians 1.13, there's a word sealed that is used. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Say, well, that's nice. That's quite a doctrinal truth that we see. We see a repetition of that in the fourth chapter that we read in verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed under the day of redemption. What about this matter of being sealed by the Holy Spirit? Obviously, it's important. It's, there's a twofold mention of it in, in Ephesians that we see that we've read this morning. I think of this, this matter that, that God by His Spirit has sealed us. There are three obvious things among others that you may think of from this passage. A, a seal denotes a finished transaction. 
In the old time, uh, a long time ago, documents used to be sealed uh, to, to say it's, it's a done deal, it's finished. Uh, there, there's a stamp. We even have some carryover in, in some legal things with real estate, don't we, Linda, where you have some, some seals and some things that have to be applied to documents to show that it's done, it's finished. Did you know that when the Holy Spirit of God sealed us as His children, it denotes it's a finished transaction. You've passed from death unto life. You're a child of Satan, now you're a child of God. And it's a wonderful work of the Holy Spirit. We are sealed by Him. I think there's a second thing that's indicated, that's ownership. That's ownership. We got some truck drivers here, don't we? Uh, Jim's got one. He's, he's been all over the country, all over the everywhere driving a truck. And many times when a truck is sent out, uh, its contents are loaded, the door is closed, and there's a seal placed on the door. And you better not break that seal because it's not yours. And only the rightful owner can sever that seal and remove the context because a seal denotes ownership. Did you know we belong to the Spirit of God? We're His. He's purchased us. It's a done deal. And He's designated His ownership by sealing us by Himself, by the Spirit of God. Then I think there's a, third, a third thing. A seal denotes security. It's sealed for security. They tried to seal the, the tomb of the Lord Jesus, didn't they? They set a guard and put a seal on the tomb, and uh, all the, the powers of earth could not prevail against the power of the risen Savior. But yet a, a seal denotes security. And so we are sealed by the Spirit of, of God. I'm glad that we're secure in Christ. Now some people say, oh, you're one of them Baptists that believes in, in eternal security. Uh, yep, that's me. Uh, that's what the Word of God teaches. You say, well, you believe that once saved, always saved. Uh, yep. That's what the Bible teaches. Uh, that's what God's Word uh, expresses plainly for each of us. Now we get into discussions and arguments about, well, I don't believe this one's saved and that one's saved. Well, we don't have to know all that. Uh, but we do know that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's security in that. And yet, we are sealed by the Spirit of God, but a stranger to Him. Now, I think there's some practical reasons why that we have become uh, ignorant and strangers to the Holy Spirit of God. Could I just throw a couple out, if I could? Uh, one, uh, one reason is that our evil enemy, our adversary, Satan, who's very active today everywhere, in churches, out of churches, on the world scene, he's very active. He knows that there is great danger and threat to him if people can just get hold of the truth of the right relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. He knows that's dangerous. He knows that the Holy Spirit of God is the power of this age. Uh, he is the person of this particular age, the church age. And if, if he can keep us ignorant concerning the Holy Spirit, then he'll let us play church a little bit longer. He'll let us go through the motions and do, do little things as long as we don't get hold of the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's one of the reasons there is a di diabolical opposition to the truth of uh, the, the valid relationship that God wants between His Spirit and, and us. And I'll submit to you a second reason you say it was kind of silly, but, um, but maybe not. Did you know that? There are some uh, religious uh, people, uh, maybe some denominations who have, have gone astray concerning the, the Holy Spirit, some of the uh, charismatics, and they've taken a wrong turn at some certain points concerning the Holy Spirit, and so they have some unusual, we would call weird experiences, and they, they build their Bible doctrine on those wrong experiences. Some of them would be counterfeits. Some of them would be fleshly manifestations. Some would be other things. Uh, but we criticize them for uh, formulating Bible doctrine on, on experiences. And rightly so. So I think there has been a, a recoiling from and a backing away from uh, dealing with things concerning the Holy Spirit because we don't want to go Pentecostal. We don't want to go charismatic. So we just stay away from that. You understand what I'm saying? Now, here's the thing. Let's suppose that there are people that base wrong doctrines on experiences. They, they, ba they have wrong doctrine because of, of wrong experiences. Well, let's turn it around this way. Is it possible that we have based doctrines on no experience? Which is worse, to base doctrine on wrong experience or to base doctrine on no experience? Well, they're both bad, aren't they? They both send you the wrong direction. One leaves you sitting in the pit. 
and the other takes you off on a wild goose chase, and they're both dead ends, aren't they? And so let's not quickly blame those who would be wrong and make errors concerning the Holy Spirit, but let's recognize the guiltiness on our part of de-emphasizing and saying, oh, no, no, we don't do that. Uh, we don't speak in tongues and we don't have uh, prophets and we don't do this and, and understand the Bible position on those things. Uh, but by, by criticizing those, we say we back away to a non-existent uh, policy concerning a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Uh, a good friend of mine, evangelist John R. Van Gelderen, has written a, a book, a dynamite book called Friendship with the Holy Spirit. Friendship with the Holy Spirit. And it's really a, a valid work. If you're interested, I can connect you with a copy of, of the book. Friendship with the Holy Spirit. If He's God, if He's the third person, if He's referred to in Scripture all the way through, if He's, if he's the superintendent of this age, shouldn't we get acquainted with the Spirit of God, with the Holy Spirit? And the answer is absolutely yes. Well, then we get down to that last verse in Ephesians 4.30 that we're using, and it said... Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. It literally means stop grieving. Stop grieving the Holy Spirit. You know, when someone from our ranks passes, when there's a death, there's a, a grieving process. It's just normal. It's natural. It's human. God has created us as loving human beings, and it's, it's normal for us to go through that. I think of our, our dear friends, the McKinney's, uh, who, who lost a daughter recently. Uh, it's been said that the, the worst experience that you could possibly endure is having one of your children die before you do. We sort of expect that we're going to get old and will die someday, but not our kids before us. And when, when there's a death, regardless of, of who it is or how it works, there's, there's a grieving, there's a making sorrowful. And there's real sorrow, isn't there? Now, let's not be hyper-spiritual and say, well, the Bible says don't sorrow. No, it doesn't say that. It says sorrow not even as others which have no hope. We don't sorrow the same way that lost people do. Uh, we know we'll see our loved ones again, don't we? We know that in, in Christ, in, in the faith. But I get sad when, when my kids leave town. <laughs> I get sad when some of you go on vacation just because of, of missing, because of the distance. Sharon always comes back and says, did you miss me? <laughs> okay. We miss folks when they're gone, don't we? Just, just because we can't be with them. I know that we have telephones and texts and, and email and all the rest of stuff, but uh, still the, the separation, the distance is, is the thing. But here the scripture says, and grieve not, stop grieving the Holy Spirit. The fact is that we as, as his children often make him sorrowful. The Holy Spirit, as it were, sheds tears. He's saddened by our conduct. Now, within the passage where that's nestled, we find the occasion that would grieve the Holy Spirit. We, we know exactly what that is. Uh, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's what grieves the Holy Spirit. When we're unchristlike to our brothers and sisters in Christ, when there's bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, there's a progression that's there in reverse order in that scripture. When there's unkindness and when there's an unforgiving spirit, we say, I just can't forgive that. The Holy Spirit is saddened. He's grieved. He's grieved. In essence, it places distance between us and a, a living relationship with the Spirit of God himself grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Now there are, are three possible courses of action that could take place. And I believe that every person in this room, regardless of, of where we, we come from in, in life and our spiritual background, would say that we would have some business to transact between us and God when we read this passage. Every one of us would to some degree. And then there are three co po possible courses of action in response to the recognition and to the realization that we've sinned against that we grieve the Holy Spirit of God, and that's probably what's wrong with our church. 
There would be three. I don't want to be absurd, but I want to be practical in, in this, this observation. And you, of course, may disagree with me or you may have some additional things. But I think these would be three practical uh, biblical things that, that would be responses uh, to, to that knowledge. One, we could declare, declare war on the Holy Spirit. We could declare war on the Holy Spirit. We could say, God, I don't care what you say. I don't care what your word says. I'm the way I am, and that's the way it's going to be, and that's just how I'm going to live. Now, that's declaring war on the Spirit of God. I would not suggest that. I would not suggest that. Uh, fasten your seatbelt because it's going to be a very rough ride from here out for you. If you're a child of God, you can't, you can't beat God. You can't outsmart him. You can't overpower him. Uh, you can't escape from him. Uh, he's going to deal with you sooner or later. So response number one would be simply to, de to declare war on God, declare war on the Holy Spirit. Don't do it. Don't even think about it. Uh, that would obviously be the wrong move. Secondly, there's a second option, a course of action concerning our grieving of the Holy Spirit or our wrong attitudes and actions toward others that sat in the Holy Spirit. Reaction number two would be this, just to go on like everybody else is. Just go on like we are. Well, that's the way I've always been. That's the way I'm always going to be. So we'll just, we'll just keep on clicking down the road just like, like we are. Uh, after all, I'm not as bad as she is or he is. And you excuse your, yourself and you, you minimize your sin because of the exaggerated sin perhaps of someone else. Uh, but the, the response is simply to just go on like we are. Well, now... I hate to keep doing this, but, but here it is. But it would be sort of like the crossroads that we're at in America right now. You know, things not working in America. They're just not working hardly in any way. And if we said, well, let's just, let's just keep going on just like we are. Let's just keep making the same mistakes. Let's keep going further from the truth like we're going now. Let's just keep following the same course of action that's being followed right now in America. And maybe something will work out. Well, that's insanity, isn't it? That's foolishness. You can't win that way. And spiritually, the same is true. If we come to the realization of the fact that we've got business conducted with God, specifically His Spirit... And we just continue going like, like we are, like everything's all right. It's just as insane as the other that I just described. That's reaction possibility number two. And then there's a third one. The third possible course of action would be this. To search our hearts and souls and get to the bottom of things personally. Now here's the amazing thing about us as individuals. You cannot answer for any other person in this room. Now, there's at the same time a blessedness and a distress in that, right? You'd like to answer because you know what you do for everybody else, but what about you? And response number three is uh, get into a soul-searching mode before God in the light of His Word, in the truth of the Spirit of God, and get to the bottom of things and make them right. And you say, but what if somebody else? Don't worry about somebody else. You worry about you. Uh, you make yourself 100% right. And if somebody looks at you and says, Whoa, look, she got right. Maybe they'll get right too. Maybe it'll be encouragement to someone else. It does work that way. You know that? You know, it's sort of like uh, an, an invitation, giving an invitation, a public invitation at the end of the message. Uh, that's uh, a controversial thing with some people. They say, well, well, you, you don't have to come forward in the invitation to do business with God. And I know that. I know that. But it sure is significant when someone does. But it tells me a, a number of things. Uh, one, you're not too proud or too afraid uh, to step out and make a public commitment of some kind. And it takes a little bit of intestinal fortitude. That's the Greek word for guts. It takes a little bit of that uh, just, just to do that. But it often is a, a signal of sincerity and of tent. And, and that's... Now that's valuable. It is. You say, um, so you don't think that a decision made in my seat back here is valid. And I didn't say that at all. Just saying that sometimes it's a parallel thing to, to making a, a, a public decision at an invitation. So when we do some soul searching and some heart searching and uh, we, we make some commitments and some decisions and it may mean that we have to go to somebody that we put off talking to 
for a very long time. Say, oh me, if you can't say amen. It may be there's someone in this church that you just avoid all the time. You just rather not speak to. Uh, if that's the case, you can say, oh me, instead of amen, because it's part of getting to the bottom of our problem with the Holy Spirit of God. We have to soul search and let him do the this, this scrutinizing in the, the mirror of his, with the mirror of his word uh, to show us the reflection of what is seen. You know, it's, it's not always a, a pretty reflection, is it? When we see things that are not right, it's not always uh, a, a beautiful thing, but it's the truth, and there are means for dealing with it in, in God's Word. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. You say, what in the world is wrong with our church? Well, I believe that the Holy Spirit of God has been grieved saddened in our church and that he cannot work in the way that he would would like to you say isn't there anything good happening in our church sure there is there are a few people getting saved there are a few people following the Lord and being discipled and growing in faith yes there are a few uh, there are a few people getting involved and active in witnessing and distributing tracts for John and Romans in some of the way. There are some people getting involved. Uh, there are some people actively full-time in, in ways involved in the service in our church. There are people doing some things. Yeah, there's, there's some good. But behind all of that, if the Holy Spirit of God is grieved and saddened, He never can fully release his rich blessings upon our church collectively until our relationship with him is, is made right. I would encourage you individually and in groups and as families uh, to get on your face before God. It's, it's the first step to revival. It is. Uh, you cannot have revival until we're right with the Holy Spirit of God. It will be simultaneous when things are made right. And we, we often ask, why does revival tarry? Uh, why don't we just see the floodgates of heaven open and, and God's blessings poured out? Uh, well, he gives us the answer to our question in the scripture as we see it this morning. Who is the Holy Spirit of God to you? If you're saved, he lives within you. And yet it's possible for you to be a stranger to him. If you're not saved, would you come and trust the Lord Jesus in the redemptive sense this morning so that the Holy Spirit may come and live with you forever and ever. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed as we conclude in prayer this morning.